creative mind. The Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council presents Walter Piston, the composer as creator. Essay number 10 in the National Association of Educational Broadcasters series, The Creative Mind, produced by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the Educational Television and Radio Center. These conversations explore the creative process as it pertains to the American artist and scientist in the 20th century. And here is our host and commentator for The Creative Mind, Lyman Bryson. Mr. Walter Piston is eminent not only as a composer, but also as a teacher of young composers and of young musicians. This is a very important point uh, in Mr. Piston's talk, because as we have heard from other guests on this series, there's a very grave question as to what university or college teaching does to the man who wants to do creative work. Is the creative mind a little bit cribbed and confined in college uh, teaching by the massive routines, by the pressure of regular work, or uh, is this a good way for the university to exercise uh, its function as the main patron of the arts in our time? Well, Mr. Piston has uh, opinions about this based upon very extensive experience. He does not find teaching uh, a restraint upon his creative powers, upon his imagination, on the contrary, he says he is stimulated by teaching and that he learns from his students. This may be partly because Mr. Piston is one of those composers, and he's careful to point out that there are many other kinds, who composes wherever he happens to be if a musical idea comes into his head. On the train, driving, he doesn't have to sit down at a piano and uh, get an audible impression of the music that's going through his mind. It goes through his mind anyhow and he simply makes notes about it. He points this out because um, it's important when one thinks about the conditions that make uh, creative work uh, more likely to realize that all creative minds do not work in the same way. Uh, Mr. Piston says there's no rule for the condition in which the creative mind can work as far as he has seen. Mr. Piston also has opinions about a subject much debated nowadays is there such a thing as American music? Well, of course, uh, there's American music as long as there are American composers. But he does not think that American composers should sit down and say, now, go to, I'm going to write a piece of American music. It's going to be American because it has something in it that sounds like the Grand Canyon uh, or something of that sort. It's going to be American because I am an American. And anything I write is going to be American music. Uh, I suppose one ought to care most about whether or not it's good music rather than whether or not it's American music. And on this, Mr. Piston has very definite ideas. Here is my conversation with Walter Piston. Mr. Piston, what we'd really like to find out is how the creative process or the creative mind works in producing music. Uh, I think it's a very common idea that there's something mysterious about this. Well, I suppose I might answer by saying that uh, composers are just as curious as you are about the process. Does the composer differ from other people uh, aside from a greater sensitivity to musical values and musical forms and sounds? Do you think he differs otherwise? I don't think so. Composers seem to me to be like uh, ordinary human beings except for this higher sense. Is that, is that sensory? Does the, does the composer hear better than other people? Uh, he doesn't hear better than uh, a great many performers who don't compose at all. Well, than other musicians, but he hears uh, better than the non-musical person, doesn't he? Uh, he hears music better, and, uh, of course, that would sort of indicate that the brain steps in there and uh, is able to explain to him what he hears. You say the brain steps in, Mr. Piston. Does well, this, uh... I, what I meant was that it's not a purely physical thing, this matter of hearing. I know some of my students hear just as well as others, and yet they seem unable, for example, to write down what they've heard. 
And I believe that's a purely uh, a mental process, uh, nothing to do with their physical ability to hear. What about uh, hearing in your mind from what somebody else has written down? Isn't that one of the characteristics of the musically gifted person? Uh, yes, uh, it's a very curious thing about that. Uh, when I was very young, I was very much surprised to find that everybody couldn't do that. Because to me, if I looked at a, a printed page of music, I heard the sounds. When you were young? Well, um, not uh, three, but uh, let's say seven or eight. You didn't have to be taught this. As I look back on it, I must have been taught it somehow. You see, we had in elementary schools, we learned how to read music. And that must have been the place where this came in. Well, on this question of the psychology of the, uh, the creative mind in music, uh, Mr. Piston, if there is this capacity beyond the ordinary persons to hear music when it's just presented to you in graphic form, can you uh, think music without uh, writing it down or without hearing it? Certainly. And that's part of the technique of a composer, is to be able to write down what he's thought. What he has thought. Well, how does he get himself into the proper condition to think? <laughs> uh, sometimes I wonder. Uh, one gets it in, uh, by simply taking some notes and uh, working on them around in various ways. One gets it by not by writing sometimes, but by, th by just thinking in the imagination. Thinking tones and form? Tones and successions of tones. And with me in particular, I find a great stimulation in hearing instruments playing. Uh, I often have the impression of uh, thinking about a piece and getting quite a, an advanced idea of how it will be. And I have to say to myself, it's all done except the notes. In other words, I haven't been able to find the sounds that are going to fit this conception. But this baffles the layman just a little bit, Mr. Piston. What do you mean by saying you have a musical idea except for the notes? <laughs> Can that well, be explained? Well, to begin with, it's a design in time. And it's a design which is going to present some certain uh, atmospheric or coloristic uh, idea. Now, you don't mean to tell a story. Uh, You're not well, talking about a programmatic uh, aspect. Uh, no, it doesn't interest me. I don't mind if other people hear a story when they hear the music, because I believe everybody interprets music according to his experience. But the, the idea of a pure musical form, a design of sounds in, in time, which has balance, which has a, a curve of uh, emotional curve or curve of intensity, and uh, rhythmic patterns, movement, there's a lot to it outside of the actual notes that you finally select to make it. And this is not, uh, this is not merely, oh, you feel gay and you'd like to find some notes and a kind of cadence to express gaiety. Uh, that, it's much more, much, much deeper than that. Uh, well, I would say it's more sensitive than that. Uh, I mean, that is, that is a generic term, gaiety, that I suppose might be applied to a certain thing. Uh, it probably would, uh, it probably would suggest a certain amount of movement. And one can think of a design of movement without notes. I have sometimes, with students, talked over a complete piece of music in which he has indicated phrase lengths, movement by uh, stems and uh, so forth of notes, but no note heads, uh, pinning it down to the actual pitch. And then also a dynamic scheme for the little piece, and um, maybe indicating at some points that it's going to be 
with heavy chords and in another place it's going to be with twining lines of uh, melody. And one can do a, a, a great deal that way with a good deal of benefit as far as a student is concerned and I believe a composer himself. The other process would be to have the notes and try to make a piece of music out of those and that's very interesting too. That happens too? Oh yes. Notes come to you as a rush of sound in your mind out of your yes, stores some, of imagination? Yes, some particular sound and you say, well, well, that suggests something, you see, and you start working on it and, and you make, uh, well, you write ten times as much music as you keep. Can we look at the things that go into music as, uh, as, for instance, we've talked a bit about the actual tones that you use. Where does the, what we ordinarily call the melody, come into this? When do you get that? Or is that part of your original concept? Yes and no. I mean, one sometimes feels that there's a certain line of curve of sound and you try to uh, make that more concrete and uh, you try different uh, patterns of notes and they aren't the one and so you try another and that's one way the other way is to start with the pattern of notes and evolve the melody from it by extending it and varying it and uh, all those technical methods that composers use to hammer notes into different shapes those are methods of development. Yes, exactly. What, uh, what about the part that could be played in this by the actual sound of, well, the actual sound of instruments? Do you hear, ever hear an instrument? Uh, well, I had, uh, you know, I've spent my life being interested in that kind of thing, and uh, I like to be around instruments. And uh, when I got this commission for the Sixth Symphony for the Boston Symphony, and started to write it, a very curious thing happened because I knew the actual sound of every player in that orchestra. And when I started to write the melody for say, for the oboe, I actually heard in my mind the man playing it. And sometimes he got ahead of me. And so I just copied down what he played in my mind. And what really happened then? taking this out of the mystery, what really <laughs> happened when the imaginary oboe player got ahead of you? <laughs> well, I must say, I, uh, I didn't accept everything he did, but at the same time, I had a kind of uncanny feeling that he was playing this melody before I could write it. This, I suppose, is the same thing as a novelist means when he says that his characters run away with him. Uh, they do things he hadn't yeah, intended. Yes. You mean to say that your melodies run away with you, too? But uh, I don't uh, accept everything there. If it runs away, I have to control it, because that is the art of music. What is it you bring it back to? What makes you see uh, that something is wrong? Uh, I think we would call that a sense of form, probably. It's violated your form that you had in mind somehow? Uh, it's violated the, uh, the importance of that particular note in relation to the whole overall design, which must never be allowed to happen, really. Sometimes one becomes a little free and lets it happen. Usually one regrets it, I believe, because you say, well, if I'd only controlled that, it would make a much better uh, design. In a sense, I suppose this is a gross and dangerous simplification. In a sense, you have these melodies which come to you more or less spontaneously, and you fit them into your disciplinary sense of form. That's that right? right, yes. So form is a discipline upon the flow of melody. Yes, it is. Form is a discipline on everything. Well, now, where do you get your, where do you get your form? You get, uh, do, do you ever start, you, well, I think you said you started sometimes with form. And well, found your there are two ways to look at form, and both must be present. Uh, one is, uh, what you say, a, a sort of preconceived design in which you fit things. The other is uh, the idea of controlled growth. A, a thing starts growing, and you don't head it off. You control it as it grows. 
I find that more interesting as a form. What's the source of this energy that makes it grow? Can it be induced? Um, I suppose it can, but I don't know how. You don't have any methods by which you induce it yourself? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I sort of admire Beethoven's uh, way of uh, hammering things out, as is demonstrated in his notebooks, famous notebooks. At the same time, there's Mozart, in which it just pours out, and the force that you mentioned seems to be working all the time. And yet, one never has the imp impression that it's not controlled in Mozart. No, certainly not. But one also never has the impression that it could fail. I mean, it has a kind of miraculous yes, vitality. Yes, and that's what you're asking, and I ask it too. Well, is it any different from other forms of uh, what we call intellectual or spiritual energy? Just a form of that, which I we don't know anything about, of course. I think it is. Same thing as a, a man who can talk about things and go from one idea to another and develop the ideas. You know, I've known artists working in other, in other uh, media, Mr. Piston. I've known painters who said they couldn't paint until they got in front of a canvas and got some uh, paint on their fingers. And I've known writers who went this kinesthetic yes. idea even further said, I have to sit down at my typewriter before I can begin yes. to think. Uh, some composers have to play the piano, and they may play music which has nothing to do with what they're writing, but it gets them in a sort of, uh, well, I don't know, state of mind. Isn't it possible there's a state of nerves which is conducive to this flow of energy we're talking about? That could be not induced, but more or less prepared for? Uh, possibly. I don't know. But you know. don't do it. You don't... I uh, don't know. You don't always compose in one chair, sitting in one corner, or no. facing one window? Uh, <laughs> I compose anywhere I can, because it's very hard to get time to compose, and so you must do it. But I also think a composer is always composing, no matter what he's doing. I mean, he, he might be driving a car, or teaching a class. We're talking uh, about composing? In an interview. Are you composing now? <laughs> I like to think I am because uh, many times I've had the experience of uh, leaving a difficult problem and finding it solved, not from sleeping on it, but from doing something else. I think that's a fairly common uh, mental phenomenon, yes, it isn't it? It doesn't seem exactly. Put a problem in the icebox and when you open it, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's the way you so work. that uh, one's mind must be working on that. Is there any way of saying which comes first in your own uh, working, Mr. Piston, or is this accidental? I mean, the rhythm, the melody, the form. Does sometimes it come I'll yes. Yeah, sometimes I'll have an uh, impression that one of those comes first, but no, uh, nothing uh, is always that way. There's a and give and take between things. Well, how do you? When you have an idea, now you, you've got these three elements, if they are sufficient to work with, you've got these three elements in some kind of uh, partial shape. Uh, can you deliberately then go at it the way, uh, well, the way a painter takes his brush and goes at a picture that's half finished? Yes, you can. You can. And uh, I think more young composers would benefit from doing more of that kind of work. That is, for example, you could take one of these ideas and uh, say, well, I'm going to write this in ten different ways, and then choose the best. And very often you choose the first one you did. But uh, any idea is capable of endless presentations. And as a matter of a composer's technique, he should be able to do that in ten different ways, but it takes quite a lot of patience. Yes, but suppose the young composer says to you, Mr. Piston, that's all very well, but that's hard work. Uh, well, I always say, who said it was easy? Not supposed to be. No, it just isn't. Is there any sense in the idea that some young people seem to have in all the arts, I suppose just as much in music as elsewhere, that all discipline all form is restrictive on their native genius? 
Yes, they do. They often have it. And uh, these days I find it very difficult to convince them that uh, it isn't necessarily so. I usually say that if your creative gifts are going to be ruined that easily, you better get ruin them now and then become a plumber or something. But I know it's not so. And uh, a great many of the young people who have worked hard at their technique uh, realize that it's not so. No danger of destroying that little spark of genius no, by hard it work? it gives the spark so much more to work with if you can throw the notes around, make them do what you want them to do. And that can only be done with practice. Is there any way really to tell whether a person has genuine talent early in his career? I'm afraid not. I think, uh, I believe with other people that um, every child is musical at the age of three, let's say. And after that, it uh, depends on his education whether he becomes less musical or not, or more. How do we spoil it? Well, we spoil it by... Uh, well, let's say teaching him how to compose. <laughs> Instead of letting him grow in contact with music and become really musical. And, uh, I think the uh, talking about music is uh, much less uh, useful developing a, a young person than the uh, becoming familiar with all the great works. I would, I would much rather have a person hear a performance of a Beethoven symphony than to hear a dissection of it into so many bones and muscles. What about this uh, matter of American music, anyway? Is there, should we, uh, we consumers, look to uh, the production of music by Americans or, and, quote, American music. Are you trying to write American music? Or are you just trying to write music? God forbid, American music. I believe every note I write is as American as anything because I am an American. It's what I have to say, and it must come from my background as, as an American. I think to take uh, an Americanism and superpose it on the music uh, sort of implies that, uh, well, that Dvorak... Uh, became an American composer by writing the New World Symphony. You say you are an American, therefore your music is American. Uh, this is rejecting, uh, I take it, all ideas that you've got to look around you for typical American themes, or well, see what there is in industrial civilization in our version to be expressed. One doesn't need to. Can't help it. I, don't, I think if one expresses, one should look for what one has in one's own soul, let's say, to say in music. And be perfectly confident that when it comes out, it's going to be you. Well, I don't see how it could be German music. I don't see how it could be French music coming from an American. What about the individuality that comes from the difference between one man and another, not between one culture and another, between one man and another? Do you lie awake nights wondering if you're being individual? No, I don't. I, I think that uh, uh, this is a movement in uh, America that's rather bad for composers to think we must all get together and be American composers. And, and then they all get apart and be different from each uh, other. Yes. Uh, I think it all comes from a real honest searching of one's own mind to say, what do I want to write in music and how is the best way for me to do it? See, the, the general drift of questions like this, Mr. Piston, uh, comes out of a concern that we all have about the future of American music. Uh, we not only want to the best that we can get out of contemporary composers like you. But we want to get the best quantity and quality of composers in the future out of our population. Yes, we do. The first thing, of course, is how, how are we going to give them the experience of hearing the music played, and that's an economic and other consideration. 
because without that experience they can't develop. And as for worrying about American composers, uh, there's an enormous quantity of them. Music is being written all over the country, and this is a big country. Good music? Well, uh, I believe that if one could get it all together, one would find as many good pieces as, that you might mention uh, in foreign composers. I heard a very distinguished musician say a couple of years ago, uh, Mr. Piston, that just what you've said about the woods being full of young composers, he said most of them hadn't yet found out what it was they wanted to say. Well, that's probably true, but he should also have said that how are they going to find it out if they don't hear their music played? Is this a great handicap to the composer? I think it is. But we have enormous numbers of uh, how many hundred uh, municipal orchestras have we oh, got? Oh, there are over a thousand now. Do they, uh, don't they play native works? Well, uh, they're beginning to. Well, let's get right down to concrete cases, Mr. Yeah. Piston. Should the local orchestras stop playing Tchaikovsky and Beethoven so much and play a little more of... Uh, well, it seems to me to be a perfectly natural thing for them to do to look around and see if they have any composers in their community. And I should think that that ought to interest them more than anything, to try to play that music. Would you say that this sums up to something like this, that if we want a richer uh, musical culture, a more creative musical culture, if we want more of the possible creative brains put to work in music, we've just got to have more good music? and more chances for everybody who can make it to make it. That's right, yes. But I think that uh, we, are here. we are having more and more good music. May I go back to one basic question uh, and see if I'm quite sure I understand you, Mr. Piston. Mm -hmm. in, the, in this matter of the composer as creator, the, the creative mind in, in music, uh, if, even if you can't analyze and quite exactly locate just what goes on in the mind. You still understand this process well enough as a working composer to say confidently that if people could be encouraged and freed to work at this, there's a great deal of musical, great deal of composing talent that we could... Oh, do. I'm sure of it. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I find them all the time in my job as teacher, you see. And it's a great pleasure to work with them. And, uh, oh, I'm sure we have... Uh, this country needn't to think it doesn't have as much creative talent as any other country in the world. Just to be careful we don't waste it. Walter Piston, the composer as creator. Conversation number 10 in a series exploring the creative process as it pertains to the American artist and scientist in the 20th century. Host for the creative mind, Lyman Bryson. Producer for the series, Jack D. Summerfield, with William Kavnis and Nadja Eisenberg as production associates. Next week, Jacob Branowski, The Creative Personality. The Creative Mind is produced and recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters under a grant from the Educational Television and Radio Center. This program was distributed by the National Educational Radio Network.